Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Grant. If you have a comment, email it to me also at greatdetectives.com. A reminder, I have a live audio chat coming up for you on Wisdom at the Wisdom app. Go to wisdom.greatdetectives.net and follow uh, my profile there, and we will be having a chat Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. That's 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 p.m. Eastern. So check it out, wisdom.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it is time for this week's episode of Casey Crime Photographer, the original air date, March the 4th, 1948, and the title is Tough Guy. The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. <laughs> What are you thinking of? I was just thinking how differently they teach kids to write today. You mean you went to school, Ethelbert? Uh, what I mean is they don't teach them to write the ABCs today. No? No, they teach them to write whole words. That sounds reasonable. Look, here's a page from my little nephew's copy book. Read it. Wow. This is something we got to get Tony Marvin to read. You go ahead, Tony. Oh, what a beautiful thought, Casey. It says here 16 times, one after the other, Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey, crime photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Our adventure for tonight, Tough Guy. Saturday night, shortly before 10 o'clock. The side street cab stand on the fringes of the city's theatrical district. A tall man, dressed entirely in gray, detaches himself from the doorway of a shabby hotel where he's been loitering and approaches a taxi that has just moved up to the first place in line. He opens its door and... Take me up to 132nd Street. Yes, sir. Whereabouts in 132nd? I'll tell you when we get there. Just take the shortest way. Okay. You a good driver? I don't get no complaints. You look kind of young to me, inexperienced. How long have you been hacking? Long enough? Yes, yeah, how long? A couple of months. Figured you were kind of wet behind the ears. Look, mister, I drove army tanks from Normandy right up to Berlin. I think that ought to qualify, qualify me to sit behind a wheel of a hack. Oh, you're an ex-GI, huh? Your uh, hack license here says your name is Isidore Goldfarb. That's right. Watch your driving, Izzy. And watch your step. And we won't have no trouble. Now look here, mister. I don't like your kind of talk. If you're looking for trouble, get yourself another taxi. And I like him... this taxi, and I like you. <laughs> you know where the Sutter Avenue Theater is? Yeah, it's off 132nd. So drive me past there after we get to 132nd. I want to see what movie's playing at the Sutter Avenue Theater. Turn around here, Izzy, and take me past the Sutter Avenue again. Well, you already drove you past that theater twice, mister. What are you going to... For the third time. Okay, but what's the big idea? What do you care, as long as you get your fare paid? Good picture playing at the Sutter Avenue. About cops and robbers. Sight and I hear. Uh, you like pictures about cops and robbers, is he? Yeah, they're all right. Yeah. They're made for jerks like you. Now, wait a they minute. They teach you that crime don't pay. Stop here, let me out. Mr. Ruff, be glad to. It's two bucks. So long. 
Wait a minute, Mac. The meter says 240. You want to make something out of it? Oh, I... I guess that's a gun you're holding inside your pocket. Start something. You'll find out if it is. <laughs> I was only kidding about the dough, Sap. Here's a five spot. Keep the change and forget you ever saw me. Remember that, punk. Hello. <laughs> No one's pushing this at all. Go, Fob, around like he didn't get in the way with it. Go right here to your precinct house here. Well, where'd the guy go when he left you, Goldfarb? He ducked around the corner of Olive Street. That's the last I seen of him. Well, you just figured he had a gun in his pocket, didn't you? You didn't see it. Yeah, but the cloth bulged out like there was a gat underneath. Mm-hmm. What do you think of it, Casey? Uh, sounds like the old gag, sir. Gag? Yeah. Goldfarb, what you've told us, this guy probably wouldn't have gotten into your cab if you hadn't been a new hacky. What's that got to do? Son, this world is full of screwballs. One particular kind decides he's got to impress somebody. Often he gets into a cab and starts to act tough like he's seen down in gangster movies. Yeah, old-time hackers are wise to type, though, pal, and they either humor the guys or give them a quick brush off. Well, you took this dope seriously, so we went through with the whole act, even suggesting he'd pull a rod on you. Yeah, it's 20 to 1 that the gat was nothing more dangerous than a pipe. But why did he have to drive me past the Sutter Avenue Theater three times and... That was part of his mystery buildup. His world is full of screwballs, son. You mean I... I just been played for a then? I think so. Because the last thing a real crook wants to do is attract attention from anyone. But I'll take down this guy's description just in case. Yeah, yeah. He, he was tall and skinny. He was dressed all in gray. Light gray hat, dark gray overcoat. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, 47 Precinct Police Station. Sergeant Benelli speaking. Hold up and murder. Huh? Sutter Avenue Theater? Sutter Avenue? Yes. Yes, I've got it. Man will be there in a the jump. Goodbye. Hey, what is it, Sarge? What is it? Theater manager and girl cashier stuck up by a lone heist guy dressed all in gray. All in gray? Looks like the gag's on us, Goldfarb. Now, you stick with us. We may need you. Right. Olson? Yeah? Rush a detail over to the Sutter Avenue Theater. Yes, sir. Bogarty? Yeah. A lot of call-to-call cars. Pick up a slender man about six feet tall, wearing light gray fedora and dark gray overcoat. Advise caution. He's a killer. Right. That's right. Hey, who did he kill, Sarge? Theater manager. I'm calling Captain Logan a homicide. Yeah. I'm getting to that theater with my camera. Uh, well, wait just a minute, Miss Summers. Uh, I want still another picture of you. Stand on the left side of that office door this time. I, I'm so upset, Mr. Casey. I, I can't pose anymore. Oh, no, look, this won't take a sec. This will be a profile shot. You've got a swell profile. Break it up, Casey. Uh-oh. You finally got here, Logan, huh? I'm here, and you'll take no more pictures. You precinct guys had no business to let this newspaper... Don't blame around. them, pal. I got here at the same time they did. Pipe down. The dead man's in that office, Sergeant. Yes, Captain. Nothing's been disturbed in there. After we made sure he was dead, we came right out here in the lobby and closed that door. Hey, you tech man, get in there and do your stuff. You too, Doc. Yes, Captain. This girl, the cashier? Yes, sir. She's got a name as cute as she is, Logan. Betsy Summers. It's Betty, not Betsy. Betty's cute, too. Shut up, Casey. I mean, Summers, my report is that you witnessed the holdup and murder. Yes, sir. I'm Captain Logan, Homicide Squad. Uh, please tell me everything that happened. Well, I I work in the booth out by the main doors. I'm the ticket seller. Tonight, as I always do, after the feature goes on for the last time, I, I checked the last of the day's receipts, closed the booth, and brought the money and the remainder of the last ticket roll used to Mr. Mackle's office. Mackle's your theater manager? He, he was. Well, go on, please. Well, as usual, he was inside, checking the previous receipts I'd given him, and his door was locked. The door being locked was usual? yes. Yes, I, I knocked, and just as he opened the door, a hand was pressed down over my mouth. A man had come up behind me. I hadn't seen or heard him. When the door opened, he pushed me inside, closed the door, and said he'd shoot Mr. Mackle and me if we made any noise. Had a gun, huh? We found the gun, Captain. Now, wait, Sergeant. Go on, Miss Summers. The man told Mr. Mackle to open the safe, and Mr. Mackle did as he was told. Then he must have thought he saw a chance to grab his gun. Anyway, he jumped at the man, and the man shot him. And then he, the man ran out that door, and I, I screamed. People finally heard me. They came to the office, and that's all I know. Anyone to see him make his getaway? We haven't found anyone who did, sir. Uh, Logan, take a look at this layout here. There's a fire exit leading to an alley only a few yards away from the door of that office. The guy went out that way, then through the alley to the street in back, which isn't heavily traveled. We know he did that because he found his gun at the alley only a few feet from that fire exit. Uh, now, let's see the gun. Here, sir. Thirty-two revolver, no fingerprint on it. Mm-hmm. One shell fired. Very recently. 
Now, Miss Summers, I understand you were able to provide a good description of the bandit. Well, I can't be sure about his face, Captain. Things happened so quickly, and, and his hat was pulled down, his overcoat collar turned up, but I, I am sure about his height, his figure, and his clothes. That's more than most witnesses are sure of. Hey, Logan, have you heard about a previous report made by a cab driver on a mug answering the same description? What's that? A hacky named Goldfarb came to the precinct house just before this job was pulled, Captain. Now, one thing at a time, you fellas. I want to know about this hacky and about everything else, but first let me get a complete picture of what's happened here. Now, Miss Summers, how much money did the stick-up get away with? About, I guess about 6000 yeah, Not a bad haul. Now, you say your screams finally brought help to you, Miss Summers. Didn't anyone hear the shot that killed Mackle? No. Uh, the picture being shown here, Logan, is a crime picture. Time the shot was fired in that office, a noisy gun battle was coming over the soundtrack. I see. Well, I'll take a look inside that office now. Captain Logan. Yeah? I've got the guy in gray. You got... You're nuts putting a pinch on me, copper. Come on, you... That's the man who held us up, Captain. He's the man who shot Mr. Mack. What's this babe talking about? I never saw her before. I saw you. I recognize your clothes. You're the killer. You're Shut crazy. up. Where'd you find this guy, officer? I spotted him in the crowd outside. I was there for the same reason the crowd is. Been a stick up Shut there. up, I said. You searched him? First thing, sir. No gun on him, and he's not carrying the stolen doll. Well, you know what he did with his gun. Hey, you fellow, where's the money you took? I asked your question. Answer it. Twice before, you told me to shut up. I'm taking that advice till I see my lawyer. Stuff like that'll get you to no place. Where's the dough? I give it a charity. Well, since you want to play it the hard way... Take him down to headquarters, boys. Hey, Ethelbert, have uh, Walter bring me up another cup of coffee. Sure, Casey. Hey, Walter! Another cup of java for this guy who never gets his breakfast before noon. Yeah. How about you, Miss Graham? No, thanks. I don't want to spoil my appetite for lunch. Well, you were able to get to bed at a decent hour last night, Annie. I had to follow up that theater job. Uh, finish telling us what happened after the cops took that guy in gray down to headquarters, huh, pal? Well, they identified him as a small-time crook by the name of Clint Morris. Uh-huh. He's been rapped a couple of times, but no gun stuff. He's none that's on the record. Goldfarb, the hacky, positively identified him as the tough guy he drove past the Sutter Avenue Theater three times. Uh, out of his cab only a block away from him. But he admitted nothing. Not a huh? thing, no. That guy's really tough. Well, his toughness won't get him anywhere. Not with the evidence he's up against. Mm. That evidence is far from complete, Annie. He's still got to be connected with that stolen dough. Well, he will be. Just give the cops a little time. When they have an almost closed case like this, it isn't often they fail to shut it tight. Yeah, yeah. But I can't help wondering about a lot of things. Mm, what thing? I, I, no, I, I'm probably all wrong. I won't stick my neck out this time. But when and if I ever get that second cup of coffee, Annie, let's you and me go down to headquarters and see what's happened since last night. This is what's happened. The case against Morris is completely blown up. Blown up, look. Captain. And you helped do it, Casey. But me? I didn't. Oh, I'm glad it happened now instead of later. The pictures you took of Morris right after his arrest, pal, one of them ran in this morning's Express. Uh-huh. Right on page one, sir. Well, the guy saw it, a conscientious guy who runs a corner drugstore only three blocks from that theater. Yeah. He comes in here with three other guys about an hour ago, and they all swear that Morris was in the drugstore when the stick-up and the murder was committed. So Morris has an alibi. He has a perfect alibi. I figured he might have. You figured Well, after he... I woke up this morning, when it was too late to do anything about it, that's funny, Casey. I got about the same idea at about the same time. Yeah? Uh -huh. <laughs> you men are so clairvoyant. No, Annie, no. We're slow on the uptake. In fact, we're dumb. I don't get it. Sit down, chums. Let's have a meeting of the so-called minds. Here's how to brighten up your breakfast table for years to come at a cost of only a dollar or two. Get a few cups and saucers, a few plates of gay, colorful jadeite. Yes, jadeite, the revolutionary new dinnerware developed by Anchor Hawking. Jadeite is a delicate, inviting green in color. It has the texture of rare and costly porcelain. Yet jadeite is as strong and heatproof as the Fire King oven glass you use for baking. And jadeite is incredibly low in price. 
For instance, a cup and saucer cost only 15 cents for the two pieces, and a complete 35-piece dinner service for six is yours for less than $5. Ask for Jadeite at your favorite chain store, department store, hardware store, or any store selling chinaware and glass. Remember, Jadeite, spelled J-A-D-E-I-T-E. Jadeite, newest triumph of anchor hawking. The most famous name in glass. First, Logan, have you freed Morris? No, but I'll have trouble holding him much longer. We've got nothing on him now. Well, if his alibi is on the level, there's nothing he can tell you. I think there's plenty he could tell, Eddie. I guess Logan does, too. Yeah. The guy made himself look guilty, Miss Williams. You mean by his actions with that cab driver? Well, sure. Morris deliberately called attention to himself. I figure now, when it's a little late. <laughs> and he was working with another guy. Another guy about his height and figure who wore the same kind of clothes. And the other man did the sicker. Yeah. While Morris was establishing an alibi. And Morris got himself arrested, so the other guy had plenty of chance to get away with the dough. Um, I don't altogether agree with that theory. Why not? Why should there have been another man in the deal? Well, the girl cashier saw him. Yeah, and only the cashier saw him. Well, that girl. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, she was trusted by her boss. He just opened his safe while she was there. As a matter of course, she could have shot him under cover of that noisy picture and, and have thrown the gun into the alley from that fire exit. Well, sure. Stuck the dough in a temporary hiding place before she yelled. Yeah. Morris, her boyfriend, would be pinched for the job before any kind of a search could be made. Well, you let her go. She had all night and this morning to recover that dough and to really hide it. Have I been dumb? Have yeah, I been dumber? I listened to Goldfarb and told him his tough guy passenger had been putting on an act. <laughs> and I fell for the act. I'll turn Morris loose, have him tailed night and day. Eventually, he'll contact that Summersdale or whoever worked with him. And yeah, then... yeah. That'll take a long time, Logan. Well, of course, you know a quick, easy way. Uh, maybe. The uh, Summers babe is a pretty cute little number. What's her looks got to do with it? Oh, to Casey, a gal's looks have everything to do with everything about it. Now, you're wrong, Annie. You're wrong. But that applies to a lot of guys less smart than I am. Mm-hmm. It might apply to Morris. What are you driving at? Well, deals between men and women that result in robbery and murder are seldom just business deals. Look, they made us fall for a corny old trick, pal. I think we can make them fall for one, too. <laughs> I know my right, Captain. You got no excuse for keeping me here. Two days ago, you learned I had an alibi that I couldn't have pulled the theater stick up. Now, you gotta let me go. Take it easy, Morris. We can hold you on suspicion. You see, this guy denies everything. Mm -hmm. He sounds on the level to me, Lou. You don't know his kind like I do. I am on a level. Oh, look, Casey, you're not a cop. You must know I'm getting a raw deal here. Can't you do something through your paper? Oh, no, no, I'd like to, Morris. (laughs) You know how things are. Yeah, sure. You got to string along with these coppers so you don't get news or pictures. You got to be as lousy as they are. Come in. I'll be right with him. Uh, Morris, don't try to crash out on Casey while you're alone with him. Bad chance with bars on the windows and steel doors with cops outside it. <laughs> I think you'll stay here. See you later. You know, I'm really sorry for you, Morris. You are getting a raw deal. Nuts, Casey. You just like the cop. No, no, no. Because I think I owe you something. You owe me something? Yeah. What? Well, if it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't have met a swell babe. Babe? Mm -hmm. Cashier at that theater. Betty Summers. Who brought her? I've been getting acquainted. She went to dinner with me last night. Yeah? Uh Uh-huh. Got another date with her tonight, too. And she's the kind of a gal I really go for. I guess she isn't finding me too hard to take it, or... Why tell me about your love life? Well, because, by accident, of course, you got me acquainted with her. <laughs> yeah, the only fault I find with her is that she's too easy to know. Well, she is, huh? Yeah. All I know or care about her is that she made a phony identification of me. Oh, well, she doesn't admit it was her phony. You're nuts. How could you claim otherwise when my alibi's been proved? Haven't the cops told you? Cops don't tell me anything. 
Hey, look, that gal doesn't really hold out on me being the guy. Oh, I shouldn't have mentioned that. I didn't know. So that's why they're still keeping me here. She's going places with you. Well, going places with me has nothing to do with her insistence that you were the stick-up man, in spite of your alibi. Well, thank her for what she's doing when you see her tonight, Casey. Tell her I don't forget little favors like that. Hey, you're not threatening my gal, are you? Your gal? No. I'm not threatening anybody, Casey. Well, thanks very much for letting me take these additional pictures of you, Miss Summers. Oh, you're welcome, Mr. Casey. You know, it's an awful nice little apartment you have. It's comfortable. Rent is cheap. That's good. That's all a working gal can ask for. Which reminds me, I gotta be getting to you. You'll excuse me. Oh, sure, yeah. I'll be on the way right away. See, I guess it isn't easy for you to go back to that theater every day after what happened. No, no, it isn't. I think I'll have to give it up and get another job. Uh-huh. By the way, the papers say that the police are still holding that man, that Morris, that I was so mistaken. Oh, yeah. They may hold on him for quite a while. What? It's been proved he couldn't have shot Mr. Mackle and stolen that money. Off the record, Summers. The cops have an idea he may have been working with the real heister. See? But if he was, he's got no big worries, and he knows it. You know, Morris is a smart guy. What do you mean? Well, even if it can be proved that he connived in the crime, his alibi puts him in the clear as far as a murder rap's concerned. See, his partner takes the rap all the way along the line. His partner did the killing, his partner took the money, and Morris took an alibi. <laughs> Be dumb, that partner, whoever he is. Hey, don't you think so? Why, oh, yes, but... Mr. Casey, I, I thought... What? I thought that uh, when two people plan a crime together, they take the same chance, and, and if they're caught, both are considered equally guilty. Isn't that the law? Well, in principle, yeah, but not in practice. You see, Morris is an experienced guy, and he protected himself. <laughs> He's quite a character, that Morris. Miss Summers, as a woman, would you figure that that low-browed, sour-looking string bean is hot stuff with a gal? I don't know what you mean. Well, the cops have found out that he's left broken-hearted dames all over the country. He loves them and leaves them, usually with all their dough in his <laughs> Quite a guy. Oh, say, look, you're fat here. We'll get started. Well, I'll run along, and thanks again for letting me come up and shoot those extra pictures. Sorry. You're welcome, Mr. Casey. So long. Bye. Who's there? Me. Clint? Me. Just a minute. I'll close the line. You've escaped. Cops turned me loose a couple hours ago and legally too. Surprised, ain't she, Ben? Surprised that you were foolish enough to come to my apartment. We're not supposed to know each other, and if you were followed. I wasn't. Smart enough to know what I'm being saying. You were smart in a lot of ways. Yeah. So are you, babe. I wasn't. But I'm learning. You learned fast. Too fast. No, I learned almost too late. But I can think when an idea hits me in the face, Clint. And I've been thinking hard ever since I started for work this afternoon. I'm glad to see you tonight. That goes double, everything you said. But I thought I might have to stall around before I could see you. Your boyfriend left you. My boyfriend? Yeah, I listened for a long time outside your door there to make sure you was alone. What are you talking about? You played me for a sap. I played you for a sap. And how? After my brain's playing that theater job. I even told you how and when to shoot your boss and where to hide the dough. Sure, you planned all the dirty work for me while you set up an alibi that'd keep you in the clear. That alibi will keep me in the clear. If you had the chance to rat on me, and you're the kind of wood rat, you little double-crosser, trying to keep me in jail, going out with guys the minute I'm put away. I didn't... Don't lie to me! Clint, Clint let me go! I'm gonna Help! kill you for what you did! I'm gonna kill you! Help! Your mitts over the throat, Morris. Take them off! Lock it! You, you cops were outside that door listening? And we heard a mouthful from both of you. Your alibi won't do much good now, Morris. This was a plant, Casey, a trap! Yeah, now you walk right into it. Casey, uh, you... I, I, I call me sweet. Or didn't you know that I'm your boyfriend? 
We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. I'd like to remind the thousands of people in the United States listening to this program of one simple fact. You can now buy your favorite brand of beer and ale in a new kind of bottle that requires no deposit and never has to be returned to the store. Because practically every one of you has known the annoyance caused by empty bottles, I repeat, you can now buy your favorite brand of beer and ale in a new kind of bottle which requires no deposit. This new Anchor Glass one-way, no-deposit bottle is light and compact, easy to carry home, takes up little space in your refrigerator. For more than a hundred years, Americans have preferred beer and ale in clean, sanitary glass bottles. So, here's a good rule. When buying beer and ale, always demand glass bottles. And remember, you can now buy your favorite beer and ale in a new kind of bottle that requires no deposit and never has to be returned to the store. The new Anchor Glass One-Way Bottle, a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. The cops found the stolen money, huh, Casey? Yeah, Bethelbert. Betty Summers told them where she'd hidden it. She told him everything. <laughs> and what she didn't tell, Morris did. After those two former lovebirds started to talk, it was hard to shut them up, because each one of them was blaming the other for the mess they'd gotten into. <laughs> I'll bet they blamed one another most for believing the stuff Casey told each one about the other, huh, Miss Wiz? Well, that did seem to be a pretty sore point with them. What made you figure they was that way about one another, Casey, and that you could... Bust him up the way you did. Well, I... Uh... Uh, Casey knows all about love, Ethelbert. He learned from books. From... Hmm. Uh, Annie, the vernal equinox will soon be here. Hmm? Spring. You might let me take you for a drive by the seashore on some moonlit night in spring. And? Uh, and then if it doesn't rain... Yeah? I might show you some things that can't be learned from books. Oh, Casey, I can hardly wait for spring, moonlight, and guaranteed dry weather. Say what? You two are spoofing. Why, Why Ethelbert? Ethelbert? I don't approve of spoofing the, the, the tender passion. As my sister Edna says, quote, Love may not be all it's cracked up to be, but folks who won't give it a try ought to be cracked down on. Unquote, and I got business to attend. <laughs> I'm um, afraid Ethelbert and Sister Edna have something, Casey. Ah, uh, yeah, Annie. I'm mm, afraid they have. Uh, it, it's almost spring. There's no moonlight, and it's raining. Well, who cares? Let's go. <laughs> Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is written by Alonzo Dean Cole. It's brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking, the most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz and is based on the fictional character of Flash Gun Casey, created by George Harmon Cox. Original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. If your child were crippled, you'd do everything in your power for him. Lucky you, your child's all right. But how about your neighbor's child? It's within your power to help him. So buy Easter seals. Help crippled children. This is Tony Marvin saying good night for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada.
This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week. The Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, I like the end of this episode. Casey tends to follow this sort of trope that I don't much care for, uh, where he kind of teases and trolls in about potentially uh, romancing her. And this same thing happened on Let George Do It, and probably a few other programs as well. But I really loved uh, Ethelbert calling them out on it in the way that only Ethelbert could. And I was totally with the studio audience on that. So I really liked that. Thought that was a nice little ending, and I enjoyed it thoroughly. All right, listener comments and feedback now. We turn to Mark, who emails in. What a surprise to hear Bill Cullen introduce Casey, a crime photographer. Uh, you have always uh, used that name of the show, but the announcer has always just called it crime photographer. And I've never heard of Bill Cullen, except when I used to hear him as the host of many different TV sh shows. Oh, good episode, too. Well, thanks so much, Mark. And uh, Bill Cullen is indeed a noted name. He was the host of the original Prices Right that aired from 56 to 65. I, of course, grew up on the revival in 1972, which continues to the present day. But Colin uh, also did host just a wide variety of different uh, other game shows. Among them, $25,000 Pyramid, uh, Blockbusters, and Hot Potato and Joker's Wild. I think probably the only one I personally ever saw was tw the $25,000 Pyramid. Of course, he did start out in radio, uh, which, you know, began as a disc jockey in Pittsburgh. And then his first game show was in 1946 on a radio quiz program, Give and Take. So, so many of these figures, you know, from 50s and 60s and even the 70s had some roots back in the world of radio. Of course, we'll get to hear more of uh, Bill Cullen's announcing as we get properly into the Tony run in the new year. As uh, Dr. Joe Webb noted over on the Blue Note Bulletin, when this episode aired, uh, the word had come out that Anchor Hawking was ending its sponsorship of Casey Crown Photographer as of uh, March 25th. So we only have three more episodes after this one. However, it'll be a bit longer because we do have a Christmas program we skipped over so we can play it at Christmas. And then uh, we, of course, have our regular uh, winter vac uh, slash Christmas vacation week. But in 2022, uh, we'll get to hear a little bit more of Bill Cullen. We don't have uh, too many of the uh, Tony episodes, but uh, thanks so much for the comment, Mark. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day, and today I want to go ahead and thank Ben. Ben's been one of our Patreon supporters since September of 2020, currently supporting us at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Ben. And that will actually do it for today. A reminder coming up on Wednesday, our live audio chat on Wisdom. You can follow along, ask questions. We'll probably go half an hour to an hour. Uh, it will be this Wednesday at 6.30. Just go to wisdom.greatdetectives.net. Next Monday, we'll return with another episode of Casey Crime Photographer. But coming up tomorrow, we head out to Los Angeles for another episode of Jeff Regan, where... It was about half past lunchtime when I reported back to the Lions office to see what was on tap for the afternoon. Plenty was... Plenty in the form of a thin, haughty little man sitting across the desk from the lion. Anthony J. had his mouth wide open when I walked in. Hey, Jeffrey, come in, come in. I, uh, I've been waiting for you. Uh, this is Mr., uh, Mr. McMurray. Jonathan McMurray. Uh, McMurray, yes. Uh, Jeffrey, he, uh, he thinks he needs our help. Uh, not sure yet, Mr. McMurray? Yes, I am quite sure. It is your employer, Mr. Lyon, who is not sure. Uh, well, now, I, I wouldn't say that, Mr. McMurray. Yours is a very unusual case. Suppose somebody tells me what this is all about. Uh, 
Well, uh, Jeffrey, uh, Mr. McGregor... I will explain my own problems, Mr. Lyon. Uh, yes. Yes, you explain them, Mac. Mr. Regan, it's quite simple. I want you to prove I am guilty of murder. What? Yeah, quite simple, Jeffrey. I have murdered my wife, Mr. Regan. I've gone to the police and confessed. They refuse to believe me. It's up to you to prove I'm right. Yeah, uh, up to us, Jeffrey. Wait a minute, Fatso. Let's get all this story, Mac. You killed your wife and the police won't believe you? When? On the morning of April 3rd at 3 a.m. three years ago. Three years? You see, Jeffrey, I told you this was Mr. a Mr. Very... Lyon. Yeah. I had gone to bed early the night of April 2nd. I heard noises several hours later. I assumed they were burglars. I went downstairs, taking my gun, of course, and saw a figure breaking in. Naturally, I fired. It was my wife. Your wife breaking into your own house? It seemed that way at the time. Perhaps I was not fully awake. We all make mistakes, you know. All make mistakes. Of course. I do not believe in murder. That is why I am here. The police wouldn't believe you. Nothing but a group of incompetent, immoral civil servants. Are we not paying them to establish law and order? I ask you, Mr. Regan, are we Finish not... the story. Uh, what happened after you shot your wife? I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.